Hey, what's up you lot, Path here, and in today's video I want to talk to you about a rather interesting physics phenomenon known as resonance. As you can probably tell from the intro to this video, this video is going to be a little bit different to the ones that I normally make, but it's going to be fun because I actually want to talk to you about some of the uses of resonance, as well as discussing briefly what resonance is. The fact that this phenomenon exists is in itself really interesting to a physicist, but humans have taken this phenomenon and actually turned it into something useful. So if you enjoy this video, then please do hit the thumbs up button and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. The concept of resonance is, in my opinion, best described in the way that it was taught to me in high school. Shout out to my high school physics teachers. This is a fairly common, but in my opinion, fairly intuitive description of what resonance is. Let's imagine that we've got a swing in a playground. And on this swing, we put a friend of ours. We're going to be pushing this friend on the swing. And the aim basically is to push our friend as high as possible on the swing or as far away from us as possible. Now, just to keep things simple, we're going to assume that we can only push with a certain amount of strength. We don't push either softer or harder than this. We always push with the same force. And to make things even simpler, let's assume we can only push at regular intervals. None of this erratic haphazard pushing. Now the thing is, we can probably imagine that if we push our friend at a rate that's too slow, in other words, we don't push them enough number of times per second or per minute, then we aren't going to manage to swing them as high as possible. But equally, the answer is not in pushing them much more quickly either. We can imagine that there will be a point when we push, but the swing is coming back at us, and so we're actually negating the swinging off our friend. We're actually making the scenario worse for ourselves. In fact, the answer is to time our pushes just right, just at the point where they're starting to move away from us. Because when we do this, the energy that we're putting into all of the swings, remember we never ever push harder or softer and we push at regular intervals, the energy that we put into each swing is only going to compound, is going to add until we get a really, really high swing. This is resonance. We, as the pusher, are putting a driving force into the swing, the driving force being applied by our arms or by our hands. And we're applying this driving force to an object, well, in this case, the swing and our friend, so not really an object, but we're applying this driving force at what is known as the resonant frequency of our swing and friend system. In other words, there is a particular frequency, a number of swings per second or per minute, that the swing and the friend system naturally want to undergo. And if we, as the pusher, can match this frequency, then we're going to cause our system to undergo resonance. So a system undergoes resonance when we apply an external driving force at its resonant or natural frequency. Or in simpler words, when we push the swing at exactly the right times to make sure that it swings higher and higher. Now, as I said earlier, the reason I wanted to make this video was not to go into intricate detail about the theoretical aspects of resonance. There's already lots that I've skimmed over, but the point of this video is to talk about a couple of examples of when we use resonance for our own benefit. So, the first example I'm going to give you is a musical one, because I'm a musician on the side as well as a physics enthusiast, and by the way, I have a second channel where I've recently released some of my own music. If you're interested, please do go check it out. But the musical example is not just a shameless plug for my second channel. I feel like this is a really genuinely interesting example of when resonance comes in handy. This is an Indian instrument known as the sarangi. For those of you that haven't seen or heard this before, it is in my opinion one of the most beautiful sounding instruments when played correctly. So when played by somebody that is not me. As you can see, this is a bowed instrument like the violin or the cello. But unlike the violin or the cello, individual notes on the sarangi are created by pushing the backs of your fingers into the sides of the string and then bowing it down here. Quick disclaimer, I am not a trained sarangi player, but because it harnesses the phenomenon of resonance so beautifully, I had to show it to you. Now, the sarangi has three main strings, which are the strings that we bow and push in order to generate musical notes. But, as you can see, there's a large number of much thinner steel strings beneath the three main strings, and they form what I like to call an inbuilt reverb system. When I play a certain musical note on one of the main strings of the sarangi, that string creates a sound by essentially wobbling back and forth at a very specific frequency. And this wobbling of the string ends up wobbling the air around it, and that air wobbles the air around it, and so on and so forth, until the air near to, or in our ears, is wobbled in exactly the same way. This wobbling of air is what our brains interpret as sound, or more specifically, a particular musical note. But interestingly, the wobbling of the air happens everywhere around that main string. 
and that wobbly air also ends up wobbling all of the thin strings beneath the main strings. Well that, and any vibrations that get transferred through the body of the sarangi itself. But on this channel, we want to keep things simple. Now, this wobbly air is behaving just like our arms did in the previous example when we were pushing the swing. The wobbly air is exerting a driving force on the thinner strings, and some of those strings will be tuned to the exact same note as the one I am playing on the main string. This means that those particular thin strings will actually be resonating. They'll wobble with a very high amplitude compared to the other strings around them that are tuned to different notes or different frequencies, which means that the thin strings that are wobbling also make sound. But crucially, it's only those strings that are tuned to the same note that ring, because those strings have a resonant frequency that is the same as the note being played. And other strings tuned to different notes by changing the tension in those strings do not ring out. This is really important, because we only want the strings tuned to the same musical note as the one we're playing on the main string to actually ring out. In this way, they end up enhancing the note being played. It gives a certain sound, a certain timbre. Whereas if all the thinner strings rung out when we played one particular musical note, then all we'd hear is mayhem. And you can see, if I play a different note now, it's different strings that are resonating. So that is one way in which we use the phenomenon of resonance to our advantage. If you want to see me play musical instruments that I actually know how to play, then definitely check out my second channel, link in the description below, it's called Path G Shenanigans. So we've seen a couple of different examples of how we can use resonance to our advantage. Firstly, by working out how to push our friend really high up on a swing so that they get really scared. And secondly, in a much more musical context. In a minute, I'm going to tell you about one more example, one which relates to a certain master's project that I undertook when I was studying physics at university. But before I do, I quickly want to mention the classic example that gets given when we discuss resonance. The example of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge that collapsed because wind was supposedly driving it so much that it wobbled up and down side to side until it cracked and broke and fell apart. We're often taught that this is a great example of resonance, but in reality it's not technically an example of resonance. The phenomenon that was responsible for the Tacoma Narrows bridge collapse is known as aeroelastic flutter. And I think the most important difference to notice between, say, pushing our friend on a swing until they swing really high, and the Tacoma Narrows bridge collapse, is that in one case we're applying a regular driving force that matches the natural or resonant frequency of the system. Whereas in the case of the bridge, it's a near continuous flow in one direction of a fluid, in this case air, in the form of wind, that caused this collapse. But this video is not about aeroelastic flutter, it's about resonance, so let's talk about that. The final example I have for you about resonance, like I said, relates to my master's project when I was studying physics at university. My project consisted of working with these tiny particles, known as nanoparticles, essentially particles on the nano scale. These were near spherical objects, so not perfectly spherical, but had a few flat faces to them because that's how they were created, and they were about 40 to 100 nanometers in diameter. They were made from gold, therefore they were known as gold nanoparticles. Now in my project, I had to take these nanoparticles and essentially attach them onto a flat graphite surface. The graphite surface just held the nanoparticles in place while I did what I'm going to tell you about next. As if working with gold nanoparticles wasn't cool enough, I was working with a massively powerful laser. Like so powerful that if somebody even looked at a reflection of like a dark, glossy surface, that was enough to damage their eyesight. I even made a vlog about this back in the day when I was making vlogs and was a really, really cringy YouTuber. So, <laughs> so if you want to check that out, then I'll, I guess I'll leave a card up here. I might not, because I'm ashamed. Um, but no, that was when I was learning about vlogging and making YouTube videos. So I do recommend that if you want to see what I got up to in my master's project in a bit more detail. But let's get to talking about resonance. The reason I was using this ridiculous laser was so that I could align it in such a way that I could fire it directly at these nanoparticles stuck onto graphite sheets. And as many of you will know, lasers are designed to basically emit only one particular frequency of light, or close to one particular frequency of light. So I had this laser which was tuned to a very particular frequency that I was firing directly at nanoparticles. Why? Because nanoparticles like the ones I was working with can actually absorb some frequencies of electromagnetic radiation. And these nanoparticles only absorb certain specific frequencies. Frequencies that cause our nanoparticle to wobble in a very specific way. In other words, these frequencies that it absorbs are the natural frequencies of our nanoparticle. And it can wobble in one of few different ways, so it has a few different natural frequencies. 
Now, there's actually a lot more to my master's project. I wasn't just shooting lasers at nanoparticles to see if I could make them wobble. Because the fact of the matter is, it was already known before I did my project that they would wobble. That was the whole point. I was actually using this property rather than discovering it. And my aim was to actually cover, to surround these nanoparticles with water and fire the laser beam at them so that they would absorb the electromagnetic radiation from the laser beam and this would cause them to wobble. And then this wobbling would generate enough heat to potentially turn the water into steam. At this point, two questions probably spring to mind. Number one, what is the point? And number two, did it work? Well, I want to address both of those in a separate video I'll make about my master's project. I actually quite enjoyed talking about it because it was genuinely interesting, genuinely really cool. But the point is that we were harnessing the power of resonance, firing that one particular frequency of light that caused our nanoparticles to wobble the most. And it just goes to show the driving force doesn't necessarily have to be a push or even wobbling air from the strings that are being played. It could even be electromagnetic radiation, light, radio waves, X-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet, and so on. And so what I want us to take away from this is that resonance is important to think about everywhere, either so that we can harness it or so that we can mitigate against its effects because it can actually be very damaging as well. High amplitude oscillations are not always a good thing. And with all of that being said, I hope you enjoyed these examples. If you did, please do leave a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more fun physics content. And leave me a comment down below as always telling me what you'd like me to talk about in a future video. Or if I've made a mistake, please do point that out as well. I'll try and correct it in the comments as quickly as possible. Oh yeah, and do let me know what you thought of this video. It's a bit more experimental. I don't usually do other shots than this one here. And I've enjoyed incorporating my music into my videos again after a, a long time. But suffice to say, this was a bit of an experiment. I really enjoyed making it though. So thank you so much for watching. Feel free to follow me on Instagram at pathvlogs and head over to my second channel as well for the music stuff. I'll see you really soon.